Backstage, our series for the uh, Antioch Alumni Chapter on Theater and Performance. As we are so glad that you've joined us today for what is a real treat, um, a conversation with the fabulous, hilarious, talented and versatile character actress, Deirdre or Didi O'Connell. Is he all right? Fine, he overslept. He's trying to kill me? As soon as possible. He's gonna hold the job. Thank you. Didi, welcome to Backstage. Thank you, it's nice to be here. And so before we get into your career, how has the writer's strike affected you? And so everything that was shooting in New York or Los Angeles and other big centers has been shut down. Um, it's just shut down. So th that affects you because then you get a call that says your job's over and we don't know when <laughs> you're going to start again. And our job will theoretically start up again as soon as the strike is settled. But nobody knows when the strike will be settled. Yeah. So, it, you know, I'm in limbo. I have a job, but I don't know when it starts. I can't <laughs> take another job in between because I don't because I have to be ready to start as soon as the strike is over. But for my money, you know, I'm on the I'm a. I am on the side of the union and I'm pretty impressed by how effectively yeah. Yeah. they have gone up against the behemoth and they've shut it down. And it's, and it's largely due to cooperation between the unions, even though the SAG members can't cross the picket line, if they have a job, they can pick it so they can, they can be a, you know, friendly picketer so they can add numbers to the picket line. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's the, the, okay. the long, <laughs> a um, lot I mean it's affecting everybody a lot and there's stuff that's being made that would not be being made if it weren't for the strike there's a this this beautiful production of Uncle Vanya in New York right now that I know a lot of those people had tv jobs and they're available so they just built this thing like really fast and really beautifully and it's in a tiny room and 40 people get to see it at night and they're just doing it sort of like under the radar they were all like wait we're all out of work. Our shows just all got shut down. Let's make Uncle Vanya. So, you know, that's great. <laughs> it's also terrible because a lot of a lot of crew members and a lot of actors and a lot of are just completely without income and will be for the duration. So this is many, many months of no income. So it's really rough stuff too. Antioch. You started in the early 70s, I think. Roughly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm and born in 53, so whatever that means. And I was like 18, 17, 18. Uh -huh. 18, 18. Yeah. So whatever that means, yeah. So you told me that Antioch, um, even though Antioch claims you as <laughs> waiting in 76, which is when you would have graduated. People, wasn't it those years where they had, um, oh God, I can't even think of the name of it right now. His name was Michael something, and he would do these these workshops where there would be all of these different kinds of art. You could make all of these different kinds oh, of art. Michael Fagens. Michael Fagens. See, yeah. um, like that was going on. What were those things called? Uh, they commissions, translations, but I can't remember what they were called. It was like every that class. Uh, Cecil Taylor was there. I would like take his classes in in music history. They were unbelievable. There, I mean, there were these things that were happening that were. Uh, I, I'll never forget and change my life. I didn't get involved in the theater department, although I was in a play. I was in a play with Roger Bath. I had always been in plays. I'd always been in plays when I was a little kid at the Pittsfield Girls Club. And so being in a play there was natural, but I wasn't, I had decided I was not going to be an actor. So to mm. go and start taking classes didn't make sense to me because I didn't want to but I was all over the place trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then eventually it was just like, I think I, I think I took leave of absence and then I never went back. Yeah. So you, then you went to Boston, right? And got mm -hmm. involved in experimental theater. Yes. So I sort of put a, my finger on a map, literally kind of put my finger on a map. I think I had a friend. I don't know if anybody remembers. Steve Dembski was my dear friend and his mom had a, house in Cambridge and she rented to students and you know lost souls and I so I went and lived with Minna and that was the perfect perfect sort of entry way back into the or 
not back into, into the real <laughs> into. world. Like, yeah, like going to get a job <laughs> and being a waitress and working in the, yeah, making my own money and being a grown up. I started in Minna's house. So that was great. And that was definitely a Antioch connection. And then I just never went back to Antioch after that. But I guess I needed to leave for a while. I was, I was pretty fragile, my, you know, mental health wise. <laughs> So yeah. when we talked uh, before this, you mentioned the complicated power dynamics of, it, of the experimental environment. <laughs> Can you say a bit more about um, that? I mean, I joined a theater company in Boston by, by finding an ad in the, the real paper, whatever those paper, that paper was called. And uh, <clears throat> it was for a workshop on Grotowski based theater, which I knew was the kind of theater that if I was going to do theater at all, I was interested in. I had, had I taken any workshops? I'd seen Ultra Banda stuff. I knew, I had read, you know, Arto and Grotowski. I knew that there was something in there that was really exciting and interesting to me that, that was not exciting and interesting mm -hmm. to me about conventional theater, which I'd been exposed to a lot because my parents loved it. So I would go see Chekhov plays in Williamstown and stuff like that. And I was always like, what are they doing? <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe, maybe, and I loved being in plays, but I didn't really like seeing them. So I thought, well, maybe I would love experimental theater. And um, so I joined this company. I ended up taking this workshop and then being asked to join the company and then working with them for three years. And it was a completely immersive experience and probably, you know, changed my life for the better in many ways, but it all involves insane power dynamics. I mean, it was a it, it's just a classic. It was a married couple that ran it. Um, he was a very controlling, uh, you know, we, we lived in it. We lived a very, a very cloistered life. We taught all day. We worked, we, we got ourselves into that glorious state of physical exhaustion where you just had no, you had no, you know, you had no skin. And, uh, and I loved that feeling. I found it for completely terrifying. I through that through that whole time, but I loved the work itself and I loved the push of the work itself. But the amount of uh, desire to please the charismatic leader was so intense. That was the drive, you know. And it wasn't like I was particularly in love with him. I mean, you know, erotically in love with him, but probably was, but. That, that exchange was so intense and I would see it all around me. We would go to theater festivals to perform and all the theater companies had the same dynamic, basically. You, I mean, I could pick out like, okay, there's his wife, you know, there's, <laughs> his, there's his girlfriend. There's the one that wishes they were the girlfriend. They're the one that, you know, and the one that is the wishes that they were the girlfriend has to like comb the wife's hair for 40 <laughs> minutes in this really amazing, interesting way. And then throw herself like, oh, against the wall in ways that you can't, I mean, they were all, and I'd be like, oh my God, we're all in the same drama. And at a certain point I was like, I can't be in this drama because I'm not strong enough to resist the endless, I, you know, I, I just knew that I, I was completely fascinated by that and completely caught up in it. And I couldn't undo that. I wasn't going to be able to be in a company like that and sort of steer clear of just wanting to please that guy. You know, I just was going to want to please mm. that guy. That's all I was really going to want to do from the time I woke up till the time I went to sleep. So mm. I realized I had to get out of that, that those companies that did that particular kind of work and built pieces over those years, you know, they were just like years of work to me. And, they, and this, the work was beautiful. And the work that I admired in the other companies that were doing this stuff was beautiful. I loved that so much, but I knew that I, you know, those, the, the incestuous madness of it all was uh. going to eat me up. So I stopped doing that. And I, and I moved to, New uh, then I was like, okay, well, how do you, what do you do? So I moved to New York city and I decided I had to learn how to um, just act, just plain old <laughs> act so that I could work in the theater, but not be in something that was going to take years to make. So even no matter how fucked up the dynamic was, it would last two months because then the job is over. So you could, <laughs> I could see yeah. like that's yeah. a much healthier way to go about this for me. I still feel like the work that I love the most in the world is, is built 
very, very slowly and, and with people who have been together forever and with people who have created a kind of family. But I still feel like I don't thrive in that situation. So, yeah. That's... So your Broadway debut was in the front page, right? The revival of that play. Yeah, it's funny because those those Lord houses in New York, which are technically called Broadway houses, you don't really feel like you're on Broadway. You feel oh. like you're in a in a big, beautiful regional theater, and that's the contract. And it's a it's a funny in between slot. But but uh -huh. yes, technically that is true. Um, but and you've been called the queen of off Broadway. So doesn't that mean that you did a lot of experimental plays? I have done a lot of experimental plays and I've done a lot of new plays and plays that, that are being written as we work and that you and that have been developed in workshop that I've gotten to be involved in. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of that. And that's mostly what I do. Mostly what I do is new plays off Broadway. Yeah. If, if, if you had to say, what have you spent most hours doing in your life? That, that would be it. OK, so let's go to talk about Dana H which was, I mean, were you surprised at what a hit it was? Completely. I think when we started to make that particular thing, and I don't know if you guys know what it is, it's this. Yeah, describe it. I'll describe it quickly. I'm not gonna, but it's it, it's basically um, Lucas Nath who, who wrote it, uh, wanted to make a piece with his mother <laughs> about his mother. She, she, wanted, she wanted him to make a piece about a very particular, terrible thing that had happened to her. And she is a, um, a hospice, now she's a hospice chaplain. At that time, she, she worked in hospitals and psychiatric wards. And so she was really interested in like following down this trauma that had happened to her. And I also she think- a, She was a chaplain, right? Chaplain. She, was a, she, yeah, she is a chaplain. And she um, lived in Florida. And she and Lucas had always wanted to work on this story. And he wasn't sure that there was a play there. And he has a very, uh, it, Lucas is an actual genius and he has this very particular way of sort of organizing his work in front of him. And he said, mom, I know this story so well. You've told, we, we've lived through it. We told each other the story so many times. I want you to sit down with my friend, Steve and tell him the whole story. I want, let's audio tape it. And then I'll have this document of the story and I'll be able to listen to it with a little more objectivity to see if there's a play in there. And then I'll, then I'll start to work. And so he was gonna write a regular play, like a mother-son play about this thing happening. And he, so they did that. So he, she and Steve met for a few days and recorded her telling him the story. Well, and, tell the story, tell the story briefly. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell the story later. I mean, it's, it's, it, she was kidnapped and um, she was kidnapped and held captive uh, for all intents and purposes for five months um, by a guy who had been a, a, you know, there's things I'm not supposed to say, so it's a little confusing, but he, he was, he was a gang member in a prison. And so he had this, this probably had a deep connection with the, with the police because he was an informant. Mm -hmm. um, she had a very hard time getting anyone to help her through that, through that and sort of in retrospect realizes, oh, that's why no one would, that's, that's, why, that's why he seemed strangely connected and I seemed like nobody was paying attention to me when I would say, mm -hmm. I am being held captive. But anyway, it's an amazing, terrible story but it's also the story of someone realizing that they can tell the story um it's the kind of thing that a person uh keeps secret because it's so embarrassing people immediately ask well how did you not get out of there well i would have gotten a gun and shot the guy well <laughs> how, how why didn't you just leave well but uh, all that all that stuff uh and all that shame and it's, you know, I think uh, there's been a lot of work on that stuff. So people kind of are, are, are realizing the kind of shame that happens to people when terrible things happen to them. And so the play is also kind of about 
what it is to tell the story. Anyway, so Lucas heard the tape of his mom telling the story. And it was just an audio tape made up with a cassette player, not that, not that fancy. Um, and immediately said, I know what to do. I have somebody has to lip sync this. And that's the piece. And I just have to edit it down to a manageable, uh, uh, you know, unit. And that will be the piece. So he saw it clear as day when he first heard the, the uh, tape. And so then it was a process of him um, finding the person to do it. And then the person learning how to do that, which they, me, didn't know if I could or if I would like doing it. I thought maybe it might feel really claustrophobic and, and uh, awful, but um, because I was basically listening to, listening to her voice and lip syncing and you're hearing her voice. So it's extremely intimate. It's got a it's got a huge tell because if I go off, you can see it because my lips <laughs> aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, it's and it's and it was just a behemoth of a thing, and I loved it so much. And I and I tried to convince Lucas that I should just say it as a monologue, but that lasted like about one minute. He was like, <laughs> "No, it's not going to be a monologue. So you can say no. You can say no to the job. But this is the job." So that's that was the piece. And and do, did I think it would be successful? Not particularly. The first time we performed it was at the Kirk Douglas in Los Angeles. And they had commissioned it along with the Goodman in Chicago. And we didn't know if we were ever gonna do it in New York. And I, I think we all felt like, here we go. We know like, you know, the, the four of us in this room, the, the, set, the sound designer, uh, Les Waters, the director, Lucas Nate, the writer, me, various other people who were involved in sort of the helping of the building of it, knew that we loved it, but that um, we didn't necessarily expect that people wouldn't just be walking out, like just not for me. Like <laughs> why? Do, why am I listening to this terrible story? Why am I watching somebody lip sync? This isn't even <laughs> acting. This is no fun. I feel trapped by the. The, by the by the piece because I can tell that she's lips I, you know and instead uh no people didn't leave <laughs> people didn't leave and when we moved it to Broadway again every every time we moved it up a level into a more commercial kind of situation we thought well this won't work surely people will just be, uh, th this is too weird. I don't need to watch this. And again, it just didn't happen. Okay, people would, tourists would walk up to me on the street and be like, are you Tana? <laughs> it's the craziest thing. Because this piece, we thought we were going to do it in a basement for our friends. We really didn't expect it to work that way. And maybe Lucas did. He's real smart. But I was, I was down to do it as a science experiment. <laughs> But I didn't necessarily expect it to be successful. <clears throat> I loved the science experiment of it, though. So that's the answer. <laughs> and uh, when you moved to Broadway, oh, uh, one more thing is just that that yeah. is an example of miss of completely um, not understanding the audience of of uh, of thinking that we're better than the audience, thinking that we're smarter and we like more interesting things and blah blah blah. It's just not true. Uh huh. Everybody underestimates them. All producers underestimate them. They think they need to like sell them Disney or Pablum or something very easy. And it, it, they're just they're just so ahead. Maybe from just the kind of art that everybody gets exposed to now from the internet and television and everything. You know, it's just people are extremely sophisticated. They loved the problem. They loved the complication of watching somebody lip sync. They loved the the story. Yeah. It, it, it was really an example of like, who the hell did we think we were that this was so obscure, you know? Anyway. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm good. I mean, you would think that uh, the last few weeks would have forewarned a person <laughs> that this could happen, but somehow you're still in a state of shock. I'm in a state of shock. I'm actually in a state of shock. Yeah, I'm very happy. What, and what is it? What? There's just one more thing that you have to do. Yeah. It's take your best actress in a play Tony Award after its first spin 
Oh, does it do stuff? Oh, get it ready. It does stuff? Get ready. All right, so you go like... Yeah, come on. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. That's so pretty cool. So you just sort of do that every once in a while yeah. when you're feeling low? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you're like, oh, God, I'm such a loser. Wait yeah. a second. <laughs> Yes, I'm not. Well, that audition didn't go great, but hey. <laughs> but hey, exactly. Oh, truly, congratulations. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much for stopping in. That you said um, that getting your brain to do all those things at once, like hear the audio, uh, lip sync the audio, look at the script. I guess in the beginning, you must have looked at the script. And then also the emotion that, that she was conveying, you had to convey. It just seemed so interesting to me that your brain took a while to figure out how to bring those things. It was together. almost neurological. It felt it felt like there were like there was that right side, left side stuff, but then multiplied by three or four because there was a there was a way that I'm so used to learning things on a page, so it's like visual so used to learning things by under, by sort of digesting them through my own animal, which might have any number of ways of, of handling a piece of material. Something might make me laugh, something might make me gulp, something might, uh, it may take me a little while to get through the sentence. And I didn't get to do any of that, I had to do hers. So yeah. really practiced it for a couple of months and, and failed many times, like just literally had days when I would turn it on and I could not do it. I just my brain would just hmm. it was really scary because I thought this this may be it I may not be able to do this um eventually when they I felt like I was literally like building a pathway mm -hmm. um, but then the, the actual doing of it was very much about surrender in a way that had, I'd never experienced before I could not have a thought that wasn't her thought while I was doing it because it would mm -hmm. it would be a blip and I couldn't have a blip I couldn't breathe in the wrong spot. I couldn't, I couldn't recover from something unless mm. she was recovering. I just had to. So I loved it because it must be like being a concert pianist or a dancer. I, I loved it. I loved having to surrender that much. Mm -hmm. I liked the feeling. Um, does an actor decide to be a character actor or does it just happen that way? <laughs> don't know well what is a character actor <laughs> well yeah that's a good you know, question I mean, but that's what all your all your blurbs say that character actors are character actor. Actor. Well, i guess that's a good thing i want to be a character actor i mean sometimes the character actor is the not lead actor but sometimes the character actor is the one who has the cool interesting part depends on how what angle you look at it from i think that um now no matter what i did i'd be a character actor because i'm old but <laughs> you know in the in the, the definition but the, but the uh I, I was not a good ingenue I think I never had the entitlement to be a really good ingenue I don't know if all ingenues are entitled but the, it sort of starts with a kind of entitlement and then you sort of break uh, it I was I so not that person so I never could pull that off and then Arcadna in Seagull I worked on her and I, now then I was much, much older and I, and I understood a lot more things. And I, I always hated that character. I was always like, who is this privileged bitch? Terrible <laughs> mom. She, she's a, probably not that gifted. She's, a, you know, our equivalent of a not very gifted movie star. And I had to, in order to play it, I had to really like scramble up all of my assumptions about who she was which is not that hard to do because all my assumptions were inside my head they weren't what he wrote <laughs> you know everybody interprets what he wrote but but he what is on that page is not necessarily that and once I once I mixed it up and was like no this is a woman who you know she she could have started from anywhere and she clawed her way she might have been a, a rather plain girl and built herself up into somebody who was like working all the time because she was the most eccentric, interesting actress and then created this career for herself and then fell crazy in love with this genius. And then that guy kills himself and leaves her with an infant and she's an actress. You know, all of a sudden my like 
everything turned around and she was mm -hmm. no longer a privileged ingenue who had turned into a movie star. And then I could play her, but I would say that I had to turn her into a character actress's part before uh -huh. I could could eat the meal. Because before that, I was just like, I hate her. She's a big old <laughs> boy. So, you know. <laughs> hmm. uh, I was just reading Brian Cox's memoir. And in it, he tells this uh, great story of Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier. Uh, making the movie Marathon Man. And uh, Dustin Hoffman was, was into the method. And so he was the character. He, he would never sleep. You know, he would mumble all that stuff. And it really irritated Olivier. And finally, he's reported to have said, my dear boy, why don't you just try acting? <laughs> right, right, right. And so... I wondered if you could talk about differing acting styles and how and what happens when those don't work out. Oh, you mean when two people have very different acting styles and, yeah. and they're not they're not compatible like that? Yeah. Oh, that just sounds right. like a terrible situation to be in. I mean, I've sure been in that situation. It I think it's very I'm trying to think if there's any time that I've felt that way that it went well, and I can't. I feel. I think. I think. I, I sort of. And it doesn't mean that people use the same technique. Nobody uses the same technique. There's not a, a technique. Unfortunately, yeah. I wish there was, because then I'd like do the technique, and it <laughs> would work. I feel like every time it's like I don't know how to make this one. This one needs a whole way of thinking about performance that I've never had to do before. But. I don't know. It feels like, you know, I mean, you can't help but think that Lawrence Olivia was probably a little judgmental and was given <laughs> like poor Dustin Hoffman some side eye and Dustin Hoffman was exhausted because he wasn't letting himself sleep. And, <laughs> but I got to say, when I watch Marathon Man, I like watching both of them. I, but I think, I think it creates a, and I don't know, maybe Dustin Hoffman would be like, oh my God, it was great. But I, I feel like when you're feeling that judgment from somebody, it shuts me down. It's very hard. Yeah. And if I'm and I've done it to other people. I mean, I wouldn't say like I'm pure. Like sometimes I just don't, I just never, I never buy what somebody's selling. And I and I try I really try. I never would tell anybody a note or tell anybody. I, I try to just pull in enough in, but <laughs> um, but sometimes I'm just like, I ah. Uh, I gotta, I gotta pretend that this person scared me, or I gotta pretend that I'm in love with this person. Or I gotta pretend that I, I uh, have so much empathy for this person who just seems like a brat to me. You know, so it's hard. So I've, I've been the judging side of it. I don't know if that has to do with acting styles, but Brian Cox actually was completely sympathetic to Olivia. Oh, it's Olivia. I know because yeah. that's like the thing. And he thing said to him. You know, I he know, said to like, him, it really represented the difference between theater in America and theater in, in the Maybe, UK. it may be, because they, you know, and the, I, I got to say, I got nothing against the British actors. They pay. But I, I think it also has to do with the nature of the parts. Like, there's parts where you're just playing somebody who's very close to you, and the situation they're in is something you relate to very easily. But if you're playing somebody who's so different from you and their situation is so dire or extreme or they're an extrovert and you're an introvert or you got to you got to do some work i think of like um you know what i think of sometimes is a million dollar baby like she and she's playing that boxer and i think they shot it very fast i think they shot it in like 21 days like a little indie and and I, I and when I read that, I was like, "How did they shoot it so fast? She had to be transformed into this boxer, this incredible. You believed that she was this, had this incredible athleticism, and then of course I realized, no, she spent a year. She made herself into that person, uh -huh. and then all you have to do is is shoot her brushing her teeth, and you think a boxer is <laughs> brushing her teeth." <laughs> But she did a year's work to make it so that it's it's not it's not doesn't just happen. Like if she was playing somebody very much like Hillary Swank, 
she could be brushing her teeth, but she was not. She was playing like a a person who probably had a lot of the spirit of her, but but had was mm-hmm. a a creature to the rest of us. No, nobody does what that character did, and he, all he had to do was shoot her because she had made herself into that. So you know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you can, you can be all you can be all snobby about it, but if somebody transforms themselves into something and then you get to just shoot it like a documentary, that's the greatest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, right? well, let's, let's talk about movies. When did you, when did you start doing movies? Um, and did you have a connection or? No, I just had an agent. So I would just go to auditions. I, I, I didn't have particular luck with it. It wasn't like, oh God, she's just a natural movie actor there there is sort of a there's theater actor auditions and movie actor auditions and it takes you a little while to learn the difference uh-huh you have to talk much quieter in the movie acting auditions <laughs> you have to really uh-huh. calm down because we're used to to uh yeah well like you like you guys said you know giving it to the back of the house like that's a particular um craft and then and then all of a sudden you begin to associate working off of words on a page with that craft so you 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 offer a little bit too much muscle so it took a long time to sort of figure that out and then um and i i've i've done some um movies but i don't feel the the uh, work of becoming a really good movie actor it's just time, you know, just like it is with theater acting and not very many people get that much time in front of a camera. I've, I've done a bunch of TV, so I've had a bunch of hours in front of the camera. You know, I've done a bunch of series. So I can't really blame not being on camera, but it, it, it is so to get really comfortable with all of the very particular, I remember one time I was on a TV show and I had to walk and say like three pages of material while I was walking. Mm-hmm. And I had to get to, and we were walking like maybe two blocks. And we had to, when we had to hit the lights, the street lights at a certain rate. And I had to get to the last street light at the end of the monologue. Mm-hmm. All right, that sounds like rough stuff. And, and I could never do it. And Finally, they were having, they had the, the can and the camera's in front of me. So it's ahead of me and I'm walking uh-huh. and, and they had me uh, hold a rope so that I was at the same distance from the camera the whole time. Uh-huh. And we shot it and we shot it and we shot it and we got it. And then at the end of three months or something, when we were still on that show and I had done three months of work on that show and we had to reshoot that scene because it was so bad. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And so that when we went back to reshoot the scene and I saw the situation, I have to hit that light, that light, that light. We have to be there by the end of the monologue. I just knew how to do that because uh-huh. I'd been working for three months in a situation where I was, my, my, my math brain knew how to solve that problem and just be like, so I'll, so I'll be at the end by there. Okay, let's shoot it. And I knew how to stay a certain distance from the camera. I don't uh-huh. know how I learned that. I didn't like uh-huh. learn it in school. It's just I had to do so many weird camera related things so many times the graduates started to have an instinct for it. And then if you'd asked me to do it three months later, I wouldn't have been able to do it because it uh-huh. was so it's right. such a specific weird skill. So then I'm sure it was gone again. You know, it's like I'd look at that and be, how the hell would a person know? How could they get to the end of the monologue at the end of the block? You know, and then you'd learn how to do it. You just learn how to do just like but not upstaging yourself or all those theater things, they become natural. You're just like, wait, I'm at the wrong angle. You just feel it. Mm-hmm. Whereas a person who's only done movies, you'd have to say to them, you can't turn your head all the way that upstage. They'd be like, why? I'm talking to the person because you have to be constantly force feeding the audience your soul. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. What, what were? Answer? Oh yeah, that was sort of the answer. So did you have favorites among the movies that you were in or the yes, TV shows? Yes, I like, I like very few of them, but I, the ones I like, I like, I like, uh, I like if, 
uh, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I like uh, Synecdoche, New York. I like, there's a Charlie Kaufman. I like um, Diane that came out about four years ago. I like Fearless that Peter Weir made. And how about TV? Sometimes had so much fun doing it, but wouldn't necessarily want to have to watch it. Um, I liked, I like this thing I'm working on now. I don't know if it's going to be any good, but I like it. And I can't talk about it, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I like it. And I, and I could, could watch it and be like, oh my God, that's so bad. But I really like it. And that doesn't happen that often. Often I feel like, you know, trying to make, the, I liked, I liked The Affair. I thought that was a good show. At least the first few seasons of it. And I liked working on it. It was really challenging and interesting. Well, what's next for you? I'm going to go to uh, London to the Royal Court and do Dan H there in January. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to finish this top secret TV show that I like. Hopefully between now and then after the strike ends. And that's all I know. Well, let's go to the question and answer. For older actors, uh, especially women, uh, a change significantly uh, in recent years. Oh, my God. Lois Smith. Hi. <laughs> um, um, my experience of it is that it has, but I don't know if that's really true. I, I really expected not to be working anymore. And I was, that was what I expected to have happen. And the fact that that hasn't happened, I, I chalk it up in my little, my little mind when I try to organize it to the fact that women are running more shit, writing more stuff, getting more stuff produced, mentoring men I feel like it's not even just a matter of like a woman writes a play for an old lady and it's not a, a, a play where you wouldn't want to see this person have experiences of any depth or importance you'd only want her to be a funny joke about a walker or something which <laughs> you know god knows so I feel like that has changed in my experience but I do think like when I look at the writers, they're not all women, but they certainly were taught by women. And they certainly had came up through the theater having an enormous amount of respect for women. And, you know, you think of Irene Fornes or uh, Carol Churchill, or, you know, these, these are the, these are the, all those guys want to write like them. So th women are, women are much more powerful in the, as a force, even if it's not direct, but also just there's, you know, if you made a season where you had, right at this minute, if you, where you had all men, you, you couldn't get away with it. You can have a season with only a few women and you can have a season where you have a lot of good workshops for women and no real full productions, but you've <laughs> got to have women in there. So it's, it's the math of it is being forced to change. And I think that's changing the culture of it a little bit. So I think I'm riding the first wave of that luck. I mean, it's not luck, but you know, that, that work, it's not luck. It's, um, so I think that, but I don't really know. I'm not really doing a statistical analysis, but I, <laughs> but it's not what I expected. But I remember I was like 35 before I ever got directed by a woman. Hmm. And I was like, oh, right. A woman could be a director. You know, like that's a little old to be thinking that, but it's true. It just <laughs> hadn't happened before. There was nobody in that position to have that professional job. I know someone asked you um, whether the Tony had changed your life. And you said, not really. And you said that the offers have not been pouring in, as you sometimes hear about, uh, you know, after a big award. And you said you thought maybe it was your age that had to do with that. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, I, I, I do. I think nobody was looking like, you know, when, you, when somebody, especially a dark horse, like is suddenly in that position, I think there's a lot of appetite for, you know, all right, let's, let's, let's get, let's get, see if we can make some money by, by having this person 
be on our show or something. And I don't think that can happen, has happened for me because of my age. I just don't think there's that same like. But you're so or- incredibly dynamic and fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, but I, I frankly, I wasn't, I, if, if all of a sudden my emails had blown up with, I, I don't know if that was really what I wanted to have happened at this point in my life. I do feel like there's a couple of like, I don't think this job I have now, my mysterious job would have happened without a Tony Award. I don't think that those people would have signed off on me having a, having that job. So it, and that, that happened in January. And so at, six months later, there was a real concrete thing that wouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, things have happened, but it wasn't like a wave. Uh, it, uh-huh. it wasn't a wave. The phone, like, phone rang it's rang awesome. all day. Oh my God, is it? No, not <laughs> at all. But, but there were things that happened that I that kind of snuck up on me that I was like, oh, right, that wouldn't have happened. I get it. They Because people were able to say, who the hell is she? I don't know. I've never seen her do anything. Well, she got the pony. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> it, it's more like that. I don't think it really... Yeah, it made it possible for people to push that wanted to push me through a door, be able to push me through a door. But nobody was like going, <gasps> I want her. Didi, Didi, how do you and Louise know each other? New York City and did it we start did we meet at Antioch? Louise. I, I, I remember you in Boston, Didi, because I worked at Theater Workshop Boston. That's right. One of my co-ops. Um, and I knew Mary because Mary and I worked at Arnold's Turtle together. That's right. Um, so it was from Boston first. So that 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 last year I was telling you guys about where I was working with Khalil Sakakini. And then, yeah. and then my sister again, my sister who, and is that why Mary ended up going on the river? I think because, yeah, she met John and I at, at Arnold's Turtle in New York. Yeah, but also I used yeah. to see you at auditions when I had an agent for a hot minute. I'd see you at auditions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You would get, we were on the same food you chain. Get, you would get the job. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, we did one thing together with um, Paul and Annaby. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Where are you? I'm in Yellow Springs, Ohio. It looks really good at the Yellow Springs, Ohio. Looks not dissimilar from Kindle New York. <laughs> You're oh my Ohio. God, yeah, it's so nice to see you. Yeah. Arnold's Turtle. So I did a play that, oh God, see, now I'm not gonna be able to think of the name. So that makes you not a very good storyteller. Oh, oh, I almost had it. The the One of the Roach sisters wrote the music. Suki? Su- well, anyway, I was like, wait, didn't you used to work at Arnold's Turtle? And she said, no, I was a regular. Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, did you know my sister, Mary O'Connor? She's like, yeah, she was a waitress at Arnold's Turtle. <laughs> this is just like a couple of months ago. <laughs> yeah, I think it, well, uh, when I met the Roach sisters, I was like, you guys worked at Arnold's Turtle. <laughs> but I you know- love thinking of Arnold's Turtle. But I think, you know, your to your, you know, your when I think of your work, I really think about this idea of new plays, new work, you know, this collaboration with the playwright, even though, you know, you're fulfilling a role, but you're such a creative force in everything you do, Didi. You know, you have this creative generative aspect of your acting that isn't neutral or isn't just fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. It's always filled with a very, um, you know, unique creative force. So anyway, um, and so I can see, you know, the, this idea of championing new plays and, and really being an actor for that is, you know, beautiful. So I yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, I, I mean, it's always interesting. I I do love those Chekhov plays. If I'm if I have like a little canon of classics, it's those that are the ones mm-hmm. that I'm more. Uh, more than Shakespeare, just because that's been my experience more. I've got to do it more. Is there anything you want to be doing? Any role, any working with any particular person or, um, you know, something that you want to happen in your professional life? 
and I want to do this play that I did many years ago in Williamstown called Before the Meeting by a guy named Adam Bach. It's a great play that we did right before the pandemic, so we never got to got, got to do it again. And it's a, a beautiful, tiny jewel of a play about the um, the uh, coffee coffee committee at an AA meeting. They get together and they 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 do the coffee cups and they make the coffee before the meeting. And so it's these these five people who do that every day. So it goes over a week, and so you get to see that fifteen minutes over a week what and a great idea for a play. and then right in the middle of it the the character that i play gets to do her, her te- she she tells her a, a story sure. so there's a word for that and i can't think of it but anyway she does she does her um thing and so that's like a half hour monologue and right in the middle of this perfect and hilarious crazy play where people are so passive aggressive about the placement of chairs and how to make the coffee urn work and it's terribly funny and then it's just the saddest thing in the world so it's a really good play but that play never got produced and so I'm always like somebody do it before the meeting for me I'll do it anywhere you, so this is your first impression tent? This is the first impressions tent. Jesus so. God, what a job to be the first impressions tent. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's been the greatest gift. It's getting everyone's first pressing of terror and joy. Yeah. How, yeah. how are you feeling? I'm, I'm good. I mean, you would think that uh, the last few weeks would have forewarned a person <laughs> that this could happen, but somehow you're still in a state of shock. I'm in a state of shock. I'm actually in a state of shock. Yeah, I'm very happy. What anyway. what has it been like being in this audience tonight? It's the 75th anniversary of the Tony Awards. It was really sweet because I think I think partly because we're all just coming back into the world, but it, it, I, it felt it felt it had a certain sweetness to it. I was looking around and seeing a lot of people that I've known over many years, and uh, when I read about that story or hear you talk about it, I mean the first thing I did was try to go online and get a script which was not possible. Um, I think he will never, I don't think Lucas is ever going to let that be published. And he wouldn't do it for TV or? No, no, it's not. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a trick, you know, it's a, it's a magic trick. It's, and and you have to be in the room for it. It doesn't translate. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody could write the story and make a very dramatic movie of it about it but I don't think that's his interest at all uh-huh I but think it's almost the opposite of that that how did she how did she get away are you allowed to tell us that yeah 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 that happens in the story she um she was in a she was in one, in one particular motel they were often lived in motels and he had befriended a construction crew in in uh in Orlando There were a lot of construction crews coming through to work on the the various theme parks. And Disney goes through construction crews like uh, candy because they are so evil. And anyway, so there was a (laughs) construction crew living in the same motel as them. And this one guy, Tommy, uh, who uh, Jim had befriended, Jim... And he would be out working on their their uh, motorcycles and cars together. She would overhear them. She didn't have any reason to like Tommy particularly. Um, one day, Jim said, keep an eye on her. I got to go do some business. He left. And Tommy came up to her door and said, get yourself, get in the car. I'm getting you out of here. And she oh. was like, what? Oh, my God. And he said, I'm getting you out of here. And, and I think... Tommy had kind of seen that, I mean, Jim was a a, a psychotic guy, but he was also a drug user. And so sometimes things would get worse. And Tommy was kind of seeing, seeing we're on a bad, we're on a bad road here. And Uh I think what'll happen next is he's going to kill this lady. So let's get her. So he just took Uh it on himself. So he got her out of there, moved her to a motel, not very far away really down the block she didn't realize that because she couldn't leave the room so she was just in this room for a week and Jim came back and he was like Tommy have you seen Dana where the hell is she and he was like I don't know so for a week she hid 
down the street and Tommy would like sneak her McDonald's. She has a, she has a story not in the play about, about the first meal that he brought her and how it tasted different than food she'd ever eaten before. It tasted so good. But she just stayed in that room with the window with the curtains drawn for a week. And then when then Jim finally gave up and he was like, I'm gonna find her. She's obviously gone somewhere. Maybe she's home at her old house. I'm gonna go. So he left. He packed up his stuff and he left. And Tommy took her and they left the they left the motel and she went on the road with the construction crew for the next two and a half years. She just traveled with them. They were a little construction crew of guys that traveled all over the Midwest and did different jobs. They had a real particular thing they did. It was one of the early parts of a construction job. So they would come in, do that thing. And it involved a lot of lifting. She talks, she talks in the thing about, about learning to lift an enormous amount of weight with this and just how great doing that work was. And so she basically was disappeared and uh on the run but jim didn't know that he was with them that she was with them so she just traveled she did didn't she feel contact? safe being anywhere so she just traveled did she contact lucas she did and lucas would come and visit her uh, she would like fly him uh, to where she was and they would stay in a motel like at christmas or wow. but she didn't go home to her parents and she didn't and she never went back to her old house for a couple maybe two and a half years pretty amazing uh, the story of just like, oh, I love to tell you that part of the story. When that part of the story is coming up, I'd just be like, oh, yeah, she's so great. And it's, she's just completely straightforward about it. Then, so she's with the construction crew and uh, she reads about a job as a hospice nurse, as a hospice chaplain. And she... Um, they go to the Walmart, they buy a little dress. She doesn't have any dresses, but they drive her to Walmart and then they drive her to the place where she's going to have the job interview and she gets the job. So she moves back down to, she moves to a different town in Florida and she starts being a hospice chopper, which she's been ever since. And what happened to Jim? We don't still... know. He's still oh. alive. Yeah. He had a stroke. He had a stroke and he was in, he was uh, paralyzed for a while, but I don't think he's paralyzed now. Hmm. I, think, I think he's gotten better, but yes, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> but one yes. of the, the way it was a weird, it was a weird uh, little game we were playing because we really didn't want him to ever, you know, like doing a play on Broadway and being on the internet is not the same thing. Nobody gives a shit about playing Broadway. <laughs> So I think we managed to stay under the radar of anything uh -huh. that Jim would have wow. been curious about. Her name is different than it was then. There was enough, but there was a lot of that. That's one of the reasons it will never get published because there's a lot of stuff for that, uh -huh. for their family about him never being yeah. able to find her. Wow. Did she, did she ever see you doing her? Yes. She came, not a lot, but, but she came... Uh, Three to three openings. Yeah, she came to three of the openings, mm -hmm. and she and she gradually uh, uh, offered me more um, love and support, but not, but not. The first time she just like had her arms crossed and said, "I'm pleased." <laughs> Remember the last time? Finally, she was. She was like, uh, "You are me. You are me." I think it's time to wind up. I want to thank you so much for <laughs> this hour of stories and uh, I just think it was fun. It was fun, you guys. Thank you. It's so, been wonderful. Just yeah. Before we go away, I just wanted to say um, last month, Chris Westhoff was here, who's working on bringing the foundry back to life. And he could not be here today, but he did say this. Um, uh, progress is coming along. Volunteer work project starts on Monday, and we'll get a lot of much needed cleanup, organizing, and facility work done. Oh, that's great. From there, some technical work will get done, and then the re-energized arts program series will be in a good position to begin come September. 
And thanks, Dee Dee. It's been really a, a, just a special pleasure to, to hear, your, hear your stories. Um, for those who don't know, I'm the provost at, at Antioch and have been working very closely with Chris to um, re-energize the foundry and, and um, think of how it can play a role, not just in the college, but especially um, in the um, village and the surrounding community. We're really focusing on the public facing public programming aspect from a, um, uh, as a performance space. The, the other thing that Chris is working on that um, Barry didn't mention is we'll have some artists and, or companies in residence, three or four at any given time. And he's mm -hmm. already lined up three. Um, mm -hmm. Two of them you probably know about. One is his own theater company, Mad River, that just finished a really wonderful two week summer workshop um, for uh, young people that culminated in a really wonderful and really successful um, youth written uh, um, uh, play at the end. I got to see a, a tiny bit of that, but also got to see the energy and the community. Um, secondly, World House Choir, which has um, long been uh, connected to Antioch, now has a literal home and, and will have a little bit more stability there. And then third, we're bringing in Gravity Works, which is an aerial troupe. So the circus is in mm -hmm. town. Um, and they've been uh, doing some classes in the wellness center, and we're hoping they can have a home in the foundry, especially in the beautiful dance studio. And we're doing some um, facilities change arounds to, to make that happen. Wow. So that's, um, so that's really exciting. The other mm -hmm. thing that is tangentially related, it's, it's uh, not coming from Chris's work to activate the public face, but we will have um, a visiting faculty member next year that I just announced yesterday. Her name is Queen Makazia Zabriski, and she'll be a visiting um, scholar in social sciences, as well as a resident fellow with our Coretta Scott King Center. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned her because she does critical race studies and cultures of performance, and she does Africanicity mm -hmm. and dance. So I'm thinking that there will likely be a connection to the foundry. And she will be with us in residence for a year while she's on leave from New College of Florida. Hmm. Where for those who have been <laughs> yeah, where DeSantis, <laughs> where the governor has literally um, declared her entire life's work illegal, no, and at this moment disgusting. Antioch is tripling oh. down on the intellectual and social and political need for this kind of work right. and offering a home for a year and will will deeply benefit from her presence. Uh -huh. So I don't yet know what her connection to the Foundry will be, but I'm sure there will be one. Yeah. Um, but in the fall, she'll be offering a cross-listed course with um, cultures of performance for both social, social sciences and performance. So that's a little, little, little bit there. Yeah, that's great. That's so great. good things are happening. Uh, I think Chris will be ready probably in another month or so to to give us a taste of what the um, college sponsored series is. And I know that um, Barry and Paula and Jessica are thinking of ways to um, that we all as a, as a community can um, support the reactivation of the foundry, including some, through fundraising. That'll be important as it be, um, as activating that becomes part of um getting Antioch to financial stability um, so that we can do what we do well. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.